Hi everyone and welcome to the Clinical Conundrums case series. This is Hisham Ibrahim. I'm one of the emergency medicine consultants in United Kingdom. And today we're going to discuss one of my cases who presented really short of breath. Before we make a start, I'd like to announce here about this course from Zero to Hero in Acute Coronary Syndrome ECG. So this is a new course that is available online now that includes 14 different modules, over 10 hours of ECG videos with regular assessment after each uh, video that covers almost all what I know about acute coronary syndrome ECGs. I think it's full of fun and I think it's going to be really useful. There will be a link to the course in the show notes of this video, so please check it out and see what you think and I'll be really keen to hear your feedback about it. The second and the last announcement here is going to be about our normal emergency physicians ECG course. Uh, the next one is going to be on the 3rd of March 2022. So uh, this is a one day virtual course uh, that is full of ECG fun and it would be great to see all of you there. So without any further delays, let's move on to our case this time. So this is a case that I've seen many years ago. I was new to the UK system um, and, um, and actually I've, uh, I've made a big mistake um, in, in my first few weeks. I, uh, I was feeling that I'm completely out of my comfort zone, so I decided to cherry pick the cases. And if you're not familiar with this uh, term, it means that I, uh, I try to choose the easy cases to see uh, and to avoid the, the apparently difficult ones. So on that day, I, um, I did that cherry picking and I thought that this is a young male that is coming with chest pain. That will be an easy one to see. Clearly, that was a big mistake for different reasons, but you all know that when you start doing this, it gets complicated. This case that we're gonna discuss turned out to be one of the most complicated cases I've ever seen in my career. And it will take us at least three, um, three videos to cover it all. So let's move on. So, this was a 23 year old male patient presented to ED with a chest pain that sounded pleuritic to me with shortness of breath of sudden onset. So he kept saying to me, doctor, I cannot breathe. Please help me. So looking at his, uh, his numbers, his blood pressure was fine, but he was a little bit tachycardic, tachypnic, temperature was 37.2. Uh, degrees and his saturation was 91% on air. So I guess many of you can guess what we're heading to um, and where we're going with that. But the surprise was a midline sternotomy scar that he's had in the middle of his chest that I couldn't really know why uh, he's had it when I saw him first. He's had an ECG. The ECG showed the following. So sinus tachycardia, right bundle branch block, right axis deviation, S1, Q3, T3. So I guess that by now you should all know what we're going to be talking about. The provisional diagnosis that I had in my head for this patient was, as you would expect, pulmonary embolism. So let's talk about this condition. Let's talk about PE or pulmonary embolism. So let's start with the definition. Regarding VTE or venous thromboembolism, this is, um, this is a term that covers two big conditions, DVT or deep venous thrombosis and pulmonary embolism or PE. And it is the third most common cardiovascular disease after acute coronary syndrome and stroke. So it's far more common than you might think. The overall incidence um, annually is as you can see 100 to 200 per 100,000 people. So let's focus on the PE and talk about the definition and types. It is a condition in which one or more emboli are lodged in the pulmonary arterial system. And usually this embolus is going to be coming from a thrombus somewhere in the deep veins. There are two types of PE. They can be provoked. Uh, that happens in 50 to 70 percent of PEs or unprovoked. And that happens in 30 to 50 percent. The provoked one, it's coming from its name. They are secondary to a risk factor uh, like immobility or surgery or pregnancy and uh, because they are associated with risk factors when you remove the risk factor the chances of the recurrence is less while the unprovoked ones 
are um, a little bit more difficult to control because they happen without a risk factor. Uh, hence, the recurrence is, is higher. In terms of the risk factors for the provoked VTE, I guess we can all remember the Virchow's triad from the medical school. So basically anything that will cause hypercoagulability or venous stasis or vascular wall damage or dysfunction, anything that will affect any of these three will result in an increased risk of venous, uh, um, venous thrombosis uh, as DVTMP. So what happens from the pathophysiology point of view? So basically here's what happens. So one or more emboli are gonna be lodged um, in and will obstruct a pulmonary artery uh, branch like what is happening here in front of us. So in result of this, the whole area of the lung that is supplied by this branch that is now completely occluded will receive no blood supply. But at the same time, it will still receive the air that is coming from the, um, from the, from the trachea from outside um, to the alveoli, but this alveoli will have no gas exchange, which means that the lung tissue will be ventilated but not perfused, which means that the dead space uh, is going to be increasing because this is an area that is not really contributing into the gas exchange process. And this is what's called ventilation perfusion mismatch or VQ mismatch. So as a result, because there is an obstruction here, the pressure behind is going to go up. So the, there will be an increased pressure in the pulmonary arteries and increased pressure on the right side of the heart. And this will result into a decrease in the um, cardiac output. So the effect of, on, on the hemodynamics is going to be depending on how big the thrombus is. And the person may present with hypotension or syncope and they might progress into shock and death due to acute right heart failure. So how to diagnose? PE can be really tricky, so don't let it fool you. PE can present with just dry cough and upper respiratory tract infection symptoms. PE can cause low-grade fever. And PE can be there with no tachycardia. PE can present with ECG findings that are similar to acute coronary syndrome. And PE can raise the troponin to make it even more complicated. And lastly, PE can present with syncope as the only presenting complaint. So what to do for PE? Well, there is a big list of investigations that you can do. You can do some blood tests like the dimer, you can do a chest X-ray, you can do an ECG, you can do a VQ scan, you can do a CTPA, which is actually the gold standard in diagnosis of pulmonary embolism. But how to use these tests appropriately, which ones to do and in which order, this is what we need to focus on. So, regarding the ECG and PE, uh, there will be a link in the, in the show notes um, to two videos that we've done before to cover all what we need to know about ECG and PE. But as a quick reminder, these are the signs that you need to be aware of. New right bundle branch block, right axis deviation, sinus tachycardia, S1Q3T3, P pulmonary, ST elevation or depression, and new T wave inversions in the inferior leads and anterior leads simultaneously. So how to manage? This is the biggest question. So this slide is probably the most important slide in the whole presentation. This slide talks about the workup in case of suspected PE and how to use the different scoring systems in assessment uh, of a case of suspected PE. So first thing is, once you start thinking about PE, you do the Wells score. Wells score is not going to tell you whether this patient has got PE or not. It will just tell you whether this patient has got high risk for PE or low risk for PE. But it doesn't, it does, it's not a yes or no, this is PE, this is not PE. It is just about the risk stratification. For the low risk group for PE, you do the PERC score. And PERC stands for Pulmonary Embolism Rule Out Criteria. So a few questions to ask yourself and your patient. And if they're all no, then it's considered negative. And if any yes, it is considered positive. For the negative ones, you know what? You're done. This is not PE. So in summary so far, 
suspected PE case with a whale score that is giving you low risk, you do the PERC score. If it is negative, you're done. No further investigations needed. If PERC is positive, then you need to do more. So you do the D-dimer. And then if the D-dimer is negative, again, you're done. It is not PE. You can rule it out now. But if it is positive, then PE is likely here. And in this case, you need to do a third score, which is the PESI score. Because now you've got a patient who's got likely have a, a, a PE and you'll need to investigate and treat. But the question now is, shall we investigate and treat as inpatients or outpatients? And um, and the PESI score is the score that's going to help you with this. It uh, stands for Pulmonary Embolism Severity Index. If the PERC score is low, that means low risk of 30 days mortality. If it is high, it means high risk for 30 days mortality. Those with low risk uh, of 30 days mortality, they uh, actually are allowed to have the uh, CTPA and treatment or further tests and treatment as outpatient. But those with high risk will need to be treated and investigated as inpatients. So this is how to run the whole uh, uh, case of a suspected PE in case that the will score is low risk. If the will score is high risk, actually you move straight to the PESI score. High risk wills means that you'll need to investigate and treat. So it's all about, do we do this as inpatients or outpatients uh, case? So this is about how to handle and work up a case of suspected PE. This slide is really important and I would strongly recommend that you pay a lot of attention to it. Okay, now we've diagnosed and we know we need to know how to treat. Treatment of PE includes anticoagulation, thrombolysis, and that will take us into a long discussion between massive versus submassive PE. There are different types of thrombolysis like systemic versus catheter directed. There's also the surgical treatment via open pulmonary embolectomy, and there is the IVC filter. We're not going to talk in this video about any of these treatment modalities because they can take a really long uh, discussion to cover them all. So now we're going to go back to our case and uh, let me tell you what happened because there was a massive surprise for me at the end. So the d dimer of this patient came back high and the provisional diagnosis was PE. So the plan was to admit and to start low molecular weight heparin and to arrange for a CTPA as an inpatient. So surprisingly, the patient refused to take the treatment and he said that he's allergic to heparin and he was advised before not to have it for life. And this was a big surprise to me because it was my first time to hear about something called heparin allergy. So the question now is, what is heparin allergy? And if you cannot give heparin to a patient with a suspected pulmonary embolism, what would you do then? So we are going to stop at this stage and uh, in the next video, I'll tell you what happened uh, to this patient after this. And we're going to talk about the condition uh, that resulted into the heparin allergy. So in summary, so far, uh, we know that PE is far more common than what we might think. And PE can sometimes require high level of suspicion to diagnose. And I'm going to leave you with this slide as the most important slide uh, in the talk. Please pay a lot of attention to this one. It's got a nice summary of all what I need to know to diagnose and manage a case of a suspected pulmonary embolism. So thanks a lot for your time and uh, your attention and um, I'll try my best to talk to you again very soon with the next part, uh, uh, second out of three I think, um, regarding this case. Thanks a lot and I'll be talking to you again very soon. Stay safe.